Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar Mhotep, with the Madhu Indela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture, coming to you this morning on January, what is today's date, the 11th, 2019. So this is my first broadcast for 2019. Um, this is unannounced. This is a uh, intended to be a very brief conversation, so it's not going to be just in-depth. Um, but I wanted to do a video versus to do just a regular social media post um, because of the length of the text. And so, um, of course, everyone should be familiar with the Lifetime docuseries on surviving uh, R. Kelly and all of the issues that have arisen uh, based on the allegations and testimonies of uh, the alleged victims. And that I will probably do something separate, you know, regarding just that in, that whole thing. I haven't seen the in, um, the, the series yet. So, uh, you know, I have some insight based on people's commentary and just some random video clips. But of course, I want to watch the whole thing. Uh, before giving my uh, total opinion. But, you know, within the larger conversation of, you know, statutory rape and, you know, what is appropriate in terms of uh, age and uh, sexual relationships and things of that nature, uh, comes the, the, the part of the conversation that focuses on you know, to what degree does a teenager have agency um, to consent? And, but more so, why, especially young women, do they consciously seek out uh, older men? And, you know, how older predators take advantage of that particular value set in attitude and behavior of young teens and how that is a mix for a a weird uh situation so i wanted to address that kind of in the back doorway because i want to talk about this this whole concept of violence so for like the past six years or so i have been doing uh research on violence and uh, I, I began to outline and organize and take notes and journal for an upcoming book entitled Religious Proselytization as a Form of Violence, subtitled The Infringement of the African Principle of Simultaneous Validity. And no, it's a long title, but uh, that's what I have thus far. So it may change by the time it's actually published but you kind of get the, the gist based on the title itself. So, you know, what I'm about to reveal is kind of within that context of, of you know, religious proselytization as a form of violence, but just more so focus on the violence part uh, in general. And I asked the question to what degree, for example, are women um, are our attitudes and propensity to violence uh, genetic versus social? And so, uh, you know, we'll get to some questions uh, to that now. So, again, I, this is intended to be brief. I do not want this to be long. It's not going to be one of my long videos. So we're just going to deal with this one brief issue. And then I will bid you adieu. Uh, please share. Uh, and... Um, like and you know continue the discussion so i'm going to share my screen i'll hide that and i'm going to go to this here so let me see and you i'm going to do full screen actually Okay, well, this will be enough for that. So hopefully you all see it. So this this brief uh, conversation I, I have titled An Evolutionary Correlation Between Female Hominids, I should say primates, 
and their attraction to male violence. Um, some shameless or unshameless plugs. Um, this is my 2016 work, uh, Nesu Biti, King and Ancient Egyptian, a lesson in paranimi and leadership that is available now. You can get it uh, on my website at uh, asarmhotep.com as well as uh, Amazon and many other online outlets. Also available on my website, I'm offering classes, uh, well, the first class in the series um, on linguistics. And so many people have been asking uh, for me to teach a course and this is available um, to the public. And um, so just visit my website, www.asarmhotep.com. And I'm offering right now the Introduction to Linguistics, a crash course. In the near future, I will be offering Introduction to Historical Comparative Linguistics and Introduction to Historical Comparative Linguistics Part 2. So, um, and, and these are the books that we're working from on the left. So my question, and there's, there's been a lot of questions uh, regarding uh, the R. Kelly situation and why is it so many women after hearing the allegations, after seeing the tape, um, and, and to many and to a certain extent his own admissions, why are they still supporting and flocking to R. Kelly? And so, you know, it raises up a lot of, you know, academic type questions as it regards, you know, the women's psychology, as it regards uh the the physiology. Is there something physical in this? And you know, this is what I'm, I'm proposing and hypothesizing about um, in this particular conversation. So, um, as many, you know, probably have seen online, uh, you know, R. Kelly had an appearance in Chicago and at this club, I think it's V5, V7, something to that nature. And it was sold out and you found women in the audience saying, take me hostage. This is uh, intriguing given the fact that allegedly, you know, he has a quote unquote sex cult and sex slaves and won't allow them to leave the house and things of that nature. And so, you know, uh, there are a few women who allege that they were quote unquote held hostage in his, uh, in his home, but you know, there's there's some counter evidence to some of those claims. But again, you know, the focus isn't going to be on R. Kelly and, this, and the whole situation, just an underlying uh, factoid, you know, that I, I want to address, just kind of using R. Kelly as the usher in. And so um, you, you wonder about the psychology of these young women, um, why they would volunteer to be taken hostage by someone who reportedly has a non-curable sexual disease, who urinates on people, who loves uh, young and teenage girls, and you know who holds people against their uh, will. So these are the allegations uh, against R. Kelly. So why would you volunteer uh, for that? And so that's what we want to kind of address. So. I want to show a video clip and uh, the, the title of this slide comes from that video clip and it, and it gives you some insight into the, the nature of, of violence and women's support for violent males. And so, you know, as, as you can see here, it says in New Orleans, murder makes you popular. Now, let's let's see what they mean by that. Um, how do I get out of here? Let me press escape. And I'm going to just go to. Uh, so hopefully y'all can see so. 
This is the link on YouTube. Again, in New Orleans, murder makes you popular. It's from NOLA.com. And the person being interviewed is by the name of Matt Terrence. And so uh, hopefully this audio comes out on the screen and that y'all will be able to uh, hear uh, exactly what he's saying. So let me play this real quick. I'm just um, making this full screen. And then I'm going to refresh. Just waiting on it to start. Excuse the delay. Some people go all time. Okay. And of course, Facebook wants to add an ad. So I apologize for the ad. It's not a Lamborghini or whatever. That's a green. Okay. Well, I've seen a lot of rough stuff growing up. Uh, a lot of murders committed in broad daylight. Maybe playing two hand touch football. And a guy just woke up to another guy. And and, uh, shoot him 20, 30 times. And you stuck as a child, you can't move because you really don't know what to do. So, you know, you're stuck right there. And over time, it, it, it becomes normal to where, oh, somebody got killed around, so, oh, okay, whatever. And that's pretty much how it was growing up in the Magnolia Project. Yes. Getting the gun is nothing. People said, well, may be harder than getting the gun. Now, if I'm just sitting outside long enough, I can watch where. Such and such put his gun there. If I need it one day, I can go there and get it. It's, it's just right there. No one's going to touch it. And you may have 40, 50 guns like that. Whereas this gun just, you know I'm saying, in this hallway, one week it may be in that hallway, you know the rotation. And this, that's how murder happens so easily. That's how friends kill friends over a simple argument. You high headed, y'all had a, a fist fight. Y'all been having fist fights for the last 10 years, but now you old enough to feel as though you can go pull a trigger. And, Friends kill friends. From the first time you see someone get murdered, you may be like, oh, wow. And then brains everywhere. To after five of them, it's known. In New Orleans, murder makes you popular. If you murder a few people, the women are going to love you. That's crazy. It sounds crazy. It is crazy. But that's New Orleans. Everybody wants to be attached to stuff. So if she's not doing nothing, she can attach her, her name to your name. Now she's somebody. She see fast money, nice clothes, nice shoes. I can go, you know, I'm in 19th grade. I can go shopping in sex. My boyfriend sells drugs. He can kill five people. That's my boyfriend. So now she has a name. Some guys are just disrespectful. They may disrespect your mother. They may disrespect your wife. And like I said, today, people are not going to talk about it. Give that man a chance, you know, to say, I'm sorry. Or some people feel like those saying I'm sorry is weak. So now it's an ego thing. So somebody like somebody had to die today. Now New Orleans. Now I, I, I hope y'all caught what he said, you know, regarding the the violence in new orleans he said that you know murder makes you popular among the women the more you kill the more women are attracted to you and you know this is very disturbing however when i first came across this clip uh, a few years ago um I, I was immediately reminded of a particular text. And, you know, for, for those of y'all who are listening, y'all know that I'm into science and biology and evolution and things of that nature. So um, I came across a text uh, that deals with uh, evolution and violence. So I told you I've been researching for a good number of years 
on the the origins and source the psychology and the physiology of violence and so um in one of these texts that i have read is called demonic males apes and the origins of human violence and in that text it is talking about you know or or, or asking the question could human violence be the result of some kind of evolutionary uh, selection um, that is present amongst the primate line. So for those you know who understand that primates and apes, that the human homo sapiens sapiens are a part of this particular evolutionary line, which composes of, you know, like the gorillas, uh, the chimpanzees, the uh, other, you know, saying world apes uh, like orangutans and things that ultimately there there's a single line for which all of these primate species, including the human beings, uh, derived, you know, saying from. And so uh, we share a common ancestor and we all evolved in different directions. And so um, within this discussion on the, of the text is this notion of gorilla in, 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 infantes, uh, infanticide. And so um, this is of course the, the killing of babies. And so gorillas are known for killing uh, or male gorillas are known for killing babies. And so uh, let me make this more let me do presentation there we go so uh, should be a little easier to read on on the screens so um again this is I'm, I'm about to start citing briefly some passages from pages 148 to 151 of this text so this isn't a the the citations that i'm about to read are not continuous uh as it appears on your on, on the screen I've, I've, I've taken paragraphs from these pages that are in sequence but there, there's some other dialogue going on there as well so um so we'll we'll see that there's a correlation between what the young man said in the video talking about how murder makes you more popular and how women love you know, dudes who, at least in New Orleans, is argued by him, um, males who murder, right? And and what is going to be revealed in this particular text? So it says here, the mere fact that a murdered infant uh, was fathered by another male means that the killer's genetic interests are served by infanticide because he removes the competitor's genes. But the male gorilla benefits in a second, more direct way. Females whose infants are killed may voluntarily join the killer's troop and have their next baby with him. So what, what happens is that, you know, male silverbacks to get a woman from another troop we can say in, in human terms, another tribe um, to win her over, he kills her child, her, her baby, her infants. And, and what happens afterwards is that the, the female uh, of the troop will join this, uh, the male that killed her a uh, uh, child, the child gorilla, and and have another baby by him, and so this happens more often when actually a male uh, silverback dies, and the the women and the children are left vulnerable, and so, um, but it, it's a little bit more complex. So we'll we'll get into that. So I just wanted to give you some some background into that. So. They continue, uh, the authors continue. This seems odd. 
A gorilla mother is intensely affectionate, clearly very strongly bonded with her infant. So why should she join her baby's killer? It's not as if any direct threat forces her to do so. Males don't bully females directly or try to kidnap them. A female can always leave on her own accord. So she doesn't have to join the killer. She could join any of the half a dozen troops that share her neighborhood. But the very act of infanticide makes the killer attractive. In fact, so strong is the strain is this strange counterintuitive logic that it appears responsible for a second rarer form of infanticide. It drives males to attempt infanticide when the chance of success is very small. Therefore, when the mother has a protector, the infant's father. So they're saying that there's no threat to the woman. It, it would be different if, you know, like in human terms, um, the, the woman's life would be threatened if she didn't go along with uh, some male's advances. But this is not the case. This woman, uh, excuse me, this, uh, these female gorillas willingly leave their troop to join another troop. Uh, and the way that they choose it is if the male is strong enough to kill um, her babies. And so it's a, it's a twisted warp logic from by human standards. But in fact, um, this is the way of the world. And so as you can see already, there's some kind of, uh, there, there seems to be a, a, a parallel to what we um, saw in the video clip, you know? And so uh, as it states here, uh, hold on, if you, uh, but the, yeah, but the very act of infanticide makes the killer attractive. So by, by killing and being known as a killer, this is, uh, this is what makes the male silverback attractive to the woman. Just like in New Orleans, the the killers are are, are what attracts the females, you know, uh, in in the Magnolia Projects and in other spaces in um, in, in New Orleans as well. And so, what, you know, what is it? So it prompts the question: Is this something primal? Is this instinctual? You know, and I'll continue. Uh, consider the strategy of a bachelor male who is ready to breed. His reproductive career depends on enticing females to join him. The best gift he can offer a female is protection of infanticide males, excuse me, infanticidal males. How does he persuade her that he'll protect her future infants well? He can show his dominance over her current mate in the most unambiguous manner. He can kill their baby. And so um, I think this is the last one. Yes, for the most part, gorillas are gentle giants, but the gentleness is interspersed with violence and their apparent peace is overlain with fear. Females are trapped in a vortex of male initiated violence. The silverback they live with is good only so long as he, has, he is strong enough to fight off all comers. When another male does break through the defenses and kills her infant, she responds in a way that violates all our assumptions about attachment, lost, and revenge. It may take a few days before the female leaves her troop, but the evidence is clear. Infant, uh, infanticide draws a female to a male. She leaves her old mate and joins the killer. She may mate with him, have babies with him, and spend the rest of her life with him. The female's choice is imposed by the logic of violence, by the threat of her next infant. The new silverback has become her hired gun in an ape universe of silverback baby killers. So again, the, the female is drawn to the acts of violence by the male. And so I'm giving one example, but this isn't the only primate species 
that is attracted where the females are attracted to the males because of their their violent tendencies and so uh again i'm not trying to draw this out so i just wanted to use one example here and it this text goes into detail that not only is it terms of violence that these um apes are involved in in terms of physical violence in terms of like beatings and the things of that nature and killings uh, the it it is it, it they have a whole section in here on rape that you know human beings aren't the only animal species that rapes uh the other primates rape as well in terms of uh, chimpanzees and things in orangutans and i even seen a special where basically uh killer whales or uh and, and uh i think more so dolphins dolphins rape you know um and, and force you know uh to have sexual acts males forced to have sexual acts uh with the females uh, i can't recall if it is in the reverse the females uh raping any young men um or, or anything to that nature um <laughs> but it makes you wonder in the grand scheme of things in terms of why do women support you know these violent you know predators you know uh like supporting the chris browns and the r kelly's and you know these these other folks and even to our president so remember our president uh donald trump is recorded talking about grabbing women uh by their vaginas and of course without their permission and you know how a few women were up in arms however you find all of these women supporting and voting for trump and so as we know from the statistics this is from abc news in terms of the key groups for trump it was uh, women that pushed him over not men and so out of Hillary Clinton and Trump, uh, out of conservative women, 18% of them voted for Clinton, but 78% of conservative women voted for Trump. White women, 39% voted for uh, Clinton, but 58% of white women voted for Donald Trump. White Protestant women, 32%, um, and 64%. Of uh, 32% for uh, Clinton and 64% for uh, uh, Trump. And, uh, and excuse me, I should have said white women between the ages of 45 through 64 for that first statistic. But the second statistic is white women in general. So it's 43% uh, for Clinton and 53% for Trump. So most women in, in basically all these categories voted for Trump, the same one who demeaned them, uh, basically talking about sexually violating them, and they just did not care. They supported them. And so, you know, I didn't want this to just seem like a, a, a black issue, that this is just women in general. So again, it begs the question, why and how, uh, or, or what's the logic, what's the psychology for these women supporting men like that men who violate uh other women and 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 do all sorts of harm uh to them and the like so this is just something i just wanted to put on your mind and uh to get your feedback on and to to you know uh present a discussion a dialogue uh surrounding this question so you know, when you're talking about young women being attracted to men in power with money, especially the bad boy types and, and R. Kelly's, you know, who's, uh, you know, having sex with these underage girls, but they just don't care. This was a theme that was presented on the boondocks, for example, you know, in their uh, sat uh, satire and, uh, and critique uh, that's, uh, on, of R. Kelly, you know, saying on the... Um, on, on the comedy network and so you know we we find this problematic and so you know this is why it's important 
you know, one of the things I discuss in the in the upcoming text, which is going to be some years because I'm working on some other texts too. So I'm kind of doing this simultaneously. Uh, so, but my research on this is off and on because I'm focusing on some other research. Plus, I'm in school. So, with with that, I I, I make the point that you know, being human is an anomaly in nature. What I mean in in, in terms of what makes us uh, the good humans, so to speak, is is culture, and culture is not inherited. It's not part of our DNA encoding. Culture is something that is verbally and socially passed on from one generation to the next. And to show how our social, you know, um, surroundings, environment shapes our attitudes and behaviors. And, and so, you know, to the question is, to what degree is some of our, are these behaviors instinctual and primal? in a sense that even that we find similar behaviors in other primates from the same primate line. So I just wanted to uh, put that on your mind. I'm not coming to any conclusions. I just wanted to throw that out there and make these connections uh, for you. We'd love your feedback. And I'm going to end this. So please share, uh, please like, and continue the conversation. Uh, thank you for joining me. And I'll see you next time. Hotel.